Dear friends in Christ, may the grace, mercy, and may the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you now and always. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for sending us your dear Son Jesus, for his taking on human flesh, his dying, his rising, and his ascension. Help us each day to know that although he has ascended into heaven, that he continues to sit that, and sit at your right hand, that he also dwells within our hearts, leading us, guiding us, directing us, that we are never alone, for you have promised that never will you leave us, never will you forsake us. May we each and every day proclaim the good news of your gospel, but always knowing that one day we'll be with you forever. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Or perhaps you learned it, meaningless, meaningless. All is meaningless. Familiar words from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, where Solomon speaks about the fact that you can attain great wealth. You can work hard. You can labor. You can grow, gain great power. But without God, it means nothing. Without God, all is meaningless. Without God, Solomon realized that you can have the wisdom of the world. But without God, it means nothing. I imagine as the disciples stood there staring up into heaven, I imagine that for them, perhaps they were wrestling with similar thoughts. They had been blessed. They had seen glimpses of God's glory all over the place. They had been with him as he ministered, as he shared the gospel, as he did so in some very real and amazing ways. And now he was going up into heaven. What must have gone through their minds as they watched him ascend? Were they wondering to themselves, what will we do now? What's next? How can we continue? Are we alone? They didn't want it to end. They'd seen Jesus Drive demons out of people. Give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. Even raised from the grave. Alleluia. But what now? What now as they stared into heaven? What now were they going to do? You can imagine as they stared that they didn't want it to end. There's former president of the Moody Bible Institute. His name is Dr. Joseph Stoll. And he tells a story that, I don't know if you knew this, but the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, they support and they sponsor a, a children's home for mentally handicapped children. And he tells a story of when he, one day he went to visit this home that they sponsor. And he walked down the halls. And as he walked from room to room looking in, he noticed something on the windows. As he walked by, he noticed there were smears on the window, little handprints on the window. As he saw it in more each of the rooms, he finally turned to the director and he asked, why are there handprints on all the windows? The director turned and said, well, the children love Jesus. They know that he loves them and they're looking forward to his return. And they look up and they stare out the window looking into the sky every day to see if he's come back. I don't know. You can imagine that the disciples must have felt that way. You can imagine why those children felt that way. They stared up. They, through the smeared glass of their own handprints, they stared up. Because they'd seen glimpses of the glory of God. It wasn't until the angels came to them. Finally, the angels, they snapped them out of their, their, their stupor, out of their stare. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Snap back into reality. But they didn't want that. They didn't want to go back to the status quo. They didn't want to go back to the way things were. They wanted to keep seeing those miracles of Jesus. Now when the angels, though, snapped them out of that stupor, out of that stare, I encourage you not to hear that as a rebuke. They came to them with encouragement, not telling them to stop, but also remember that there was still more for them to do. They were still here, and although it was okay that they were staring, God also gave them the command to go into the world, to preach, to teach, to 
to baptize in his name. Jesus himself said, though, don't lose sight. At the end of Matthew 24, he said, Concerning that day and honor, hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Therefore, you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The disciples, they lived in a tension. On the one hand, they knew the command of Jesus to go out, to go into the world, to share the good news. But on the other hand, to be ready, to be waiting, to be expectant of Christ's second coming. They lived in that tension. Now, we don't like tensions very much, but as is the case in tensions of Scripture, they're necessary for shaping us as the people of God. And we, like the disciples, we also must live in this tension. And not just be aware of this tension, but we must live this tension. We must live in the tension of knowing that our Christ is coming again, that Jesus will, as he ascended into heaven, descend again to this earth in all power and glory. But we can't just wait. We have work to do. We have things to do on this earth right now. But what happens when we don't live in this tension? See, having that focus on the future, it's meant to shape our lives. But if we don't have that focus on the future, it changes the way we live our lives. It removes the hope from our lives. And then we can hear Solomon's word very clearly. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. When we live with Christ as the center of our lives, it affects the way we raise our children, the way we teach our grandchildren. It affects the way we instruct the next generation and set an example for them. When we have the hope of the resurrection, Christ living within us, it affects the way we live with our families, our friends, with our coworkers, those who work under us. It affects the way we look at each day. It affects our worship of God. Our worship is not merely to be resuscitation. Well, maybe sometimes we need resuscitation, but, re but re repetition. It's not meant to be that. It is meant to be true worship from the heart. Christ-centered worship. But when Christ is not to the center of our lives, all that changes. All of that is off kilter. When we replace Christ as the center of our lives and stops looking to the future, staring up into heaven where we, our hope is, instead of raising our children, our grandchildren, we let TV, internet, the latest games, popular media raise our children. Instead of setting an example in the workplace, in our families, we conform to behaviors and attitudes that do not honor God. Worship becomes more of a habit, a, something we have to do that can easily be replaced by sporting events, by sleeping in. Instead of that center, centering our lives on Christ. In the, in, historically, the devil used different idols. He used idols of wood and metal and stone he got at people where they were at in their, in their doubt of God and their fears and on the battlefield so people would worship these idols. Historically, he would, their fertility of their fields, the, the devil would lead them to, to seek after these false idols. But he's changed his attack strategy. And more and more we see Christ being removed from the center of the li our lives and being replaced by ourselves. In our society, it becomes more about our comfort, about what we like, about what's important to us. The center of how things should be becomes about us. If something doesn't go our way, we point our finger at God and we blame Him. If things get out of kilter and the world stops revolving around us, instead of turning to God, we turn on God. To demand how He could be in control. How He could possibly allow things to be the way they are. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. When Christ is not the center of our lives, where is our hope? Where is our comfort? What is our point and purpose? Think about it. When things don't go your way, when things seem to be spinning out of your control, how does that conversation go with God? 
How does that discussion go with him? Do you seek his guidance or do you tell him how life should be? Do you humble yourself before him? Or do you demand an answer of him? When Christ is not the center, when we don't live in that tension, things become hopeless. But when we do live with that hope, when Christ is the center of our lives, it changes everything. Instead of seeing the wickedness of the world, yes, we will see it, but we'll also see the glimpses of God's glory everywhere. Instead of living as if we are without purpose and without place here, we'll see how God can use our hands and our feet, as broken as they may be, to share his gospel. Instead of being focused on ourselves, we let God see the world, the lost and the dying, and their need for the gospel. Their need to hear the same words we heard, you are forgiven. The words that Jesus spoke to us, when he died on the cross, the promise that he gave to us that one day we would be with him forever. When Jesus takes the center of our lives, when we focus on that hope, that promise, each day becomes an opportunity to glorify God. And worship is a joy, an opportunity, not a burden or a requirement. And that's one side of the tension, though. On the other side, there, and I don't know how common this is, but people can sometimes get so focused on that last day, on that promised hope, that promised salvation, that they lose sight of that, that right now here on this earth, like the disciples, there is a need for us to share the good news. We have an example of Scripture of this. The church of Thess- Thessalonica. The church of Thessalonica, they, they heard the good news and they were excited. They heard the promises of God and they were thrilled. So much so that many of them sold everything they had. They stopped taking care of their families. They stopped taking care of their responsibilities, quit their jobs. This is where Paul says those words, if any man should not work, he shall not eat. Paul wasn't being cold-hearted or mean there. What he was focusing on is the fact that these individuals were placed here for purpose. Those fathers who had, quit, who had stopped being fathers needed to return to being fathers. Those, those women who had quit their jobs needed to return to their jobs. And well, yes, we need to be focused on heaven, focused on the hope we have. We also have work to do here on this earth. And that work is to go, to preach, to teach, and to baptize, to proclaim God's word to the very ends of the earth. Because there are too many people who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There are too many people who do not call upon the name of the Lord and know that they are forgiven. We're not called to be the spitting image of Christ, to be perfect. The Lord knows we can't. We're sinners. But we are called to go to preach, to teach, to baptize, to go into our, fr- our families, into our communities, <laughs> into our grocery stores, and share that good news. Share that promise of salvation wherever God may place us. We don't like tensions very much, but this is a tension that shapes us. It's a tension that forms us. It's a tension that we are meant to live in because as we live in this tension, we do have that hope of what is to come, but also that we have that urgency of proclaiming God's word now, proclaiming to others the promise of God's forgiveness, sharing with them the good news. It's not a new message. It's not a different message. It's the same message that the disciples received. As the disciples stood staring up into heaven, as they heard the words of the angels, the angels said to them, just as Jesus goes up this way, he will again return. He will again return. And when he comes, he will not come as a baby in Bethlehem, but he will come in all his power and in all his authority. 
And Paul says it so well in Philippians. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is the hope that we look forward to each day, that we share his love as we do those things that that God our Father has appointed in advance for us to do. Jesus has risen. He will rise again, and we too shall rise with him. Alleluia. Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, as we celebrate your ascension this day, as we celebrate your, your, your reign above the clouds with the Father and the Spirit in all glory, lead us also each day to, to live out this truth in our lives, to live out this promise in our hearts, to share this good news with others, that you are Lord of all, that you reign in glory and power. Lead us to worship you each day and to, to celebrate that opportunity to worship. Lead us to proclaim your name without fear, but with the joy of knowing, knowing that others too will hear the good news, that you will send your spirit and you will work through our simple words, through our simple actions, and they will see your glory and know your forgiveness. In all things we pray, in the name of our risen Savior, Christ Jesus, amen.